Okay, omega number will quite try to make it as simple as possible. I think the burden with this charge is very simple. That the adoption of this policy does more good for the for the electorate of the individuals and for the policy constructions of the PEP and the current opposition level. So it's just a value judgment on whether or not we should adopt this policy. So, and whether it's interesting or not, our policy is twofold. Number one, we will follow the British system. Right? Her Majesty's most loyal opposition will be given the system. Right? They will be given titles, they will be given office space, and they will be given like, the ability to access certain documents that they otherwise don't have access now because of their, or their, uh, their capacity as shadow ministers and officials. So, like, Specifically, it's this thing called short money in the United Kingdom, right? Where the government gives them like a certain amount of money to like these are not salaries; these are just to run offices and run and access to these documents yeah, yeah. and have, like secretaries to run these kinds of things. So like it's not a lot, right? So it's like in the United Kingdom, two thousand fifteen or something like four million pounds for a five year term, and this is minuscule compared to the ministers of two. This is like the cost of two minutes pay minister salary. So I think we're more happy to pay these kinds of things. Number two. What is this debate not about? This debate is not about logistical problems. This debate is not about the fact that we only have six yeah, current yeah. opposition parties and then like, like oh, we can't, we can't do it now because we have enough people. I think this debate assumes that in a, whether or not we should enshrine this with legislation. So far as that there comes a time in which there are enough opposition where they can take out this position of office to do so. But and what, does think, what do we think will look like if we enact it now? So we think like, uh, Pitam Singh will be the leader of opposition, Sylvia Lee will be the shadow finance, shadow chancellor of the exchequer, um, Lo Da Kiang will be the shadow home minister, and so far as they, they will take over the important ministries, and then some of the NCMPs will take over other opposition schools. Okay, three things in this speech. First, uh, principles of democracy. Number two, what are the practical outcomes and why this is better than that? Number three, what's the comparative? So first, on the principles of democracy. Um, we think that the, the reason is the, the principles of democracy is that what denies democracy and the reason is why democracy is important is that we give these people massive amounts of power. Yeah, every decision they make affects the millions of lives at, on a daily basis. What is necessary to account, hold people accountable is like a spotlight against their positions of power and ensure that they are kept accountable because we don't want any form of leadership. Particularly in the Singaporean context, we think that currently there exists no meaningful mechanism to hold these individuals in Power. Like, so we support all other forms of oversight, like credit, the CPID and everything. But we don't see why it's necessarily a bad idea to hire specific individuals to counteract specific individuals that have political incentives to specifically go after individuals and study policies okay. of, their, of their one ministry but they otherwise have no incentive to do so. So, but what we feel, the thing we want to note here is that the historic reason as to why the shadow cabinet, like, the historic reason as to why the shadow cabinet even existed in the United Kingdom. And we think it's important for security reasons. The reason as to why Shadow Cabinet was created, or uh, why Shadow Cabinet was existed or created to begin with, was because it used to be possible where you could just kill the entire cabinet, right? Like during World War II in the United Kingdom, the Shadow Cabinet existed in now 10 Downing Street, and it was bombed during World War II, and they moved it underneath, like, there's a current museum button basement. We suggest that the threats of security currently still exist, and the current Singapore context about plan is really this. Like, let's just ask a very simple question. In the Singapore context, what happens if our cabinet gets blown up? Like who is going to take over? They exist no meaningful of like no like DAP managers have no access to these documents, have no political and most of these people are just managers and those things. The people who have an incentive to study policies and visit keep on track of policies are shadow ministers because we did not have incentive to stay in bounds. But in order to begin this access to them. So we think for security reasons and for the necessary the continued the survivability of the Singaporean state, we need a shadow cabinet. Crucially, we need people in positions of power that can take on the vac power vacuum that will potentially exist when it comes to security. What are the practical outcomes in this debate? First, on accountability and transparency. So as it stands right now, like, let like, me okay, understand one thing. When Lee Kuan Yew came to power under the British, Indep Indep British independence, he was the official leader of opposition. Okay, this was an official title in the Singapore statute. When Singapore gained independence and he became, and he became minister, he removed it. So Pritam Singh is the unofficial leader of opposition right now. The reasons of consolidation of power this no longer exist. The, also, crucially, why it did was because of the removal of this legitimacy, they no longer have access to documents. So the way in which the shadow cabinet works is that they are House Parliamentary Committees in which if you are a member of Shadow Cabinet, you, you'll know you won't be the chair, because the chair will be from a PAP member, but you'll be a ranking member. Number one, you have access and the ability to sway discussions in, in, in policy committees. But number two, you have access to confidential documents like state security that you otherwise don't have access to in the world which we should Like, this, this is important, because it's very easy for PAP to say, we can't give them these confidential documents, because who are they to take over these positions? They're just random MPs. But insofar as they have officially tag them as official shadow cabinet members, and these are people who can take over ministries because they are they've been given the, the security briefings or like specific finance issues, we legitimize their ability to know such, these things well. This increases transparency and accountability. But like more importantly, right? So here's a good example of Singapore's history. Uh, the escape of Maslama under Wong Kan Seng. Till this very day, we have zero clue of how Wong Kan Seng of how Maslama escaped. We just know he climbed up a toilet, but we have no idea how he climbed over that, that, that picket fence, right? We have no idea how he did it. 
In a world in which there's a shadow cabinet, because, and the reason why the PBA, the PBA is political incentive is not to reveal as to how they escape, or be completely transparent in the of society, it's because they want to be seen as a, so, as a government that can hold people. Uh, yeah, sure. So why are opposition members in parliament not able to serve as a check and balance? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah because they don't accept the confidential documents. That, that's what no, like, 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 it's very, like, okay, they serve as a check and balance. But, okay, here's the, I guess I'll tell you about those right now. Recently, the debate between uh, Sylvia Lim and Heng Swee Kiat about GST balloons, right? The reason why Heng Swee was able to like obliterate uh, Silver Lim was because, unfortunately, Lim, Silver Lim was making approximation against us because she didn't have access to financial docu documents of the Ministry of Finance. We drastically changed that. We changed the ability of this debate scenario to occur. So, like, yes, this debate is not a PAP's perspective. It's not about what is best for the PAP to stay in power. Because obviously, best for the PAP to stay in power. They obviously want to blind opposition, not give them anything about them. Like, haha, we beat you because you just didn't know all these things. So, thank you. So, why is this good for, like, why is this, like, why is this good for policy questioning? Number one, it, knows, it removes the ability of opposition to scatter shot, right? As it stands right now, we don't earmark specific individuals. We just randomly question, we just randomly question individuals. We change, we drastically change that. Because the way in which the opposition and this work is that they want to gain political capital. So they just hit on everything they can hit on in all the We change at the point in which we earmark specific individuals to go after specific people. At the point in which you have specifically back to one other minister, you are intended to go into that detail as to the policies as to what he has done wrong or how things can be better. We think this is a good thing because, well, we want good policies that will benefit the rest of Singapore. Why is this good? Why is the dialysis and the opposition? Why is it actually a good thing for opposition? Because, and why is it good for Singapore politics? We think it is incredibly arrogant of BAP to say, own self, check own self, right? Like, we are going to be here forever. We suggest that what's necessary in a vibrant democracy is a functioning opposition. We don't have that now. This allows the opposition to function insofar as they are able to be seen as credible opposition. Insofar as they now like, we agree the opposition is scattered, this is a structure in which we, uh, we compel them to be more structured and not as scattered as they currently are. But how does this affect the electorate? Currently, the electorate like, don't really care about certain issues. Right? You, might, you might care about one specific two, two issues, but you don't really care about the vast majority of things. We now give individuals a policy shortcut to who they can look to, who they want to critique, who they can look to, who they can critique, they want to do so, and why I think that's a good thing. What's the comparative? I think opposition needs to continue, support, support a continued world in which opposition has no meaningful mechanism to check against a, a state which has dominated the politics, politics for Singapore for, for centuries. For all these reasons, we are very proud to
a huge problem with the fact that you think the way out is to give them confidential documents, right? We think that concept at the start of national security, you want to ensure that we don't lose our entire like cabinet from an explosion, a security threat, then maybe you don't want to release confidential documents to just about anybody. Then furthermore, we really think that's not the point, right? If you really somehow need these confidential documents, then Parliament needs to push the cabinet a little harder on this point to see there are some things that we should know they are not telling us. They also told us a few quick things on the effect of policy making, what happens to the electorate. What I would tell you, right, is that one, they create little real check and balance. Number two, they create poorer policy making. And number three, they will actually increase any political apathy on the part of the electorate towards bringing in opposition. But all that I will tell you now in my case, I have three points for you. So firstly, let me highlight quickly what the status quo is and why our alternative is so much better. Um, our alternative is status quo, right? So in Singapore right now, right, what we all understand is that a lack of strong cohesive opposition in parliament. You also see long-term dominance by the PAP. The current mechanism that we do support to ensure that some opposition representation is the NCMPC. We think, number one, it is sufficient. And number two, the shadow cabinet actually undermines it. So the real question is, in this power asymmetry that is a Singapore political landscape, how is meaningful opposition ensured? I want to give you three rubrics, okay? One, there must be a balance between getting opposition into parliament and undermining democracy, first metric. Second metric, you have, you have to balance between getting opposition into parliament and ensuring that people are not so comfortable with an artificial opposition that they never vote them in national party. Third metric, right, you have to get opposition into parliament, but balance that against creating puppet governments that have no real impact. That brings me on to my second substantive. Why a shadow cabinet does not meet all three criteria, right, and why an NCMP scheme does. So we realise, right, that firstly, with regards to the fear of undermining democracy, a shadow cabinet precisely undermines democracy. Why? In a moment. We realise, right, that the cabinet is too important a set of positions. And then, and therefore, it says the prerogative of people who actually want a mandate when the people, this kind of decisions and this kind of power cannot be just artificially given to people. But before I go on to my next metric, yeah. Um, do you take issue primarily with the release of currently classified or confidential documents or with the concept of a government in waiting as a shadow cabinet in general? Both, right? I think they are like associated with each other. I think the problem with shadow government in waiting, no, a shadow cabinet in waiting, right? Is that you're giving the most important positions to, to, uh, of the country to people who are not legitimately elected. I'm going to point out this even worse where these important positions don't come with any real ability, but it's the new ones that you have to wait for. On then, to my next metric, do we make people too comfortable with a fake opposition? What is the NCMP scheme like and why is it better? The NCMP scheme reserves 12 seats in parliament for an opposition, right? And we realize that therefore, the two-third majority, the two-third PAP majority in parliament is still not averted. I.e., PAP still has the power to vote and therefore change our constitution. Therefore, yeah, there is still an incentive by locals to vote in more parliament members, right? So you can hear, so the, um, you can hear your opposition members in parliament, but you also still want to vote them in for an actual voice. But in a shadow cabinet, the view of it is very different, right? The electorate is like, oh, we kind of have like opposition ministers, though not really. So what is the incentive to vote in more people? Third metric on like creating puppets. Unlike NCMPs who get paid, who have equal voting power, right? Because as of 2017, they were allowed even to vote on money supply bills. Your shadow ministers don't get that kind of power. Essentially, what am I saying? Here's the nuance that I promise. Yeah, we are creating puppets in important positions. They have no real power and a great deal of fake presence. When it comes to like balancing positions and ability, what we want is you to be in a position of some power with the actual ability to exercise this power, not on their side, where they get positions of great power with no ability to exercise that power. On that, my next two substantives, both on outcomes. My second sum is on the worst case outcome that is created. On their side, they undermine the NCMP scheme. Why? Because who is going to want to listen to the NCMPs anymore, right? And furthermore, the alternative they get out of the cabinet is not really that great. Because there's shadow cabinet now, is various opposition parties lumped into one big shadow cabinet. And that actually prevents the further maturation of all the different opposition parties, which just brand themselves differently. The SDP must give you a different view as to whether the workers' party can. And they come and all put together as one ambiguous opposition bloc. Then, on to my last substantive, the at best outcome. At best, they slow down cabinet processes, right? As they mentioned, this, uh, this like shadow ministers must oppose policies to sound good. But the thing is, the cabinet is entrusted with big decisions that ultimately must be made with great urgency. We don't think it's a good 
I get to have somebody come in to like wreck everything at every turn that is proposed by say the education minister. Next, do they actually have access to technocrats? Because if they do, right, it's really confusing for say the ministry, right, that usually works very closely with the minister, right, and therefore think that, that as a great hit to the public service is also the ability to provide on the ground implementation of the kind of policies the minister may push for. But if they don't get the access to technocrats in the ministries, right, then you'll be swaying the populace with like uninformed critics and opinions. Either way, that's not do well for what a cabinet is supposed to function as. Therefore, we think we're the ones that the best thing of ways to create opposition voices in the Singapore landscape, I'm extremely proud to oppose. Like the, the, the opposition will just hijack this. 
This is unrealistic. Like panel, in the world in which BNP already have a majority, they are likely to still hold that realm of power. What changes is in a situation where virtually your entire cabinet was bombed down like World War II, that counterfactual requires people who have access to this document. That's why the problem on opening opposition was that they presumed that the, the NCMP is sufficient. That's why the direct that, that's why the direct comparative here is more important. That we are literally okay, so I want to point out this NCMP argument on that side, right, is bullocks because it is not mutually exclusive. We can have NCMPs too. But what we are doing is strengthening the role of the NCMPs by ensuring that they are not just viewed as tokenistic individuals, but people who have a say in this policy in this parliament and actually have access to documents that's important for critique in closing. If the core of your case is that national security, all the members of our cabinet are going to die, why is it that the shadow cabinet are all alive? <laughs> uh, because, because, because people exist in different places. And not everybody are in the same place. When PAP hold their internal meetings, right, and this, this, this is factual, huh? listen to this. Like when the when the British Parliament formed itself during World War II, literally only the person of the ruling government formed and had a department and had, had a political party meeting when, when the bomb strike. Literally, these are things that would exclude individuals not from that party. So there's a very fucking real reason as to why these people are not going to be affected by this. No, thank you. So how do you get better check and balances? Our case is actually fairly simple. The idea is that the NCMP is not a bad idea. But it's insufficient. And this is where they didn't deal with this. Because what's the additional layer of check that only opening government provides is this. We allow for an improvement of the current status quo in the which people actually have some real power. The NCMP currently, and this is why they don't deal with this argument, is that the NCMPs currently virtually have no say. Like they don't have the ability to access documents, they don't have the ability to pass a lot of the policies in current status quo. I mean, to vote on a lot of like policies in status quo. And that's the problem in this debate. No, thank you. So, how do we actually get individuals to be more applied, be less apathetic and more likely to vote opposition? This clashes with all of Ray's argumentation. How do we have a blueprint where more opposition people are voted in? I think the most important thing is people don't vote the opposition because they're comfortable. People vote the opposition because they're seen as fucking stupid, because BAP does a good job at making them look like food. How do we change this in opening government? When you actually, and this came in Douglas's speech that went unresponded also, is that when you have, for example, a opposition candidate who have access to classified files and documents and actually can have a meaningful parliamentary debate based on facts and not approximation, <coughs> where that makes them look like a fool because the common question, line of questioning will just be, you don't know this for sure. And the average reasonable person, not us debaters who sometimes feel like we are more intellectual than we really are, but most other individuals don't have that access to those kind of nuanced discussions that happen in parliament. So to the average reasonable person in Singapore, they automatically think that the Workers' Party is wrong or that they are making or they are sprouting nonsense as opposed to actually debating on facts. Because it's very easy to hide the fact that the policy critiques are somewhat legitimate at a point where they don't have access to all of these concrete policy mechanisms. That's why in order for them to be seen as credible, they actually need to have a constructive and healthy parliament debate that's going on. The only way this happens when they have access to facts and figures that PAP can't just say, these are things we want to shy away from and these are the things we don't want to give up. That's why on that side of the house, it was problematic that they failed to recognize the improvement to the NCMP scheme that we brought to you uniquely in opening government. But the second thing we do is tell you why there is a so exclusive benefit that they don't want to engage with when you confer certain exclusive power that comes along with this title and that's why you get better critique and better policy formation. Very proud. Yeah, yeah.
Hey, is this all recorded? <laughs> Joel, I swear to God. Joel, if you take my shit, Joel, I'll cry. <laughs>
one of their sales out. Because if you, if it's true that their mechanism is so successful, you give them so much power, this undermines democracy, which is the very important principle how that Hui Yi talked about earlier in the speech. Okay. Thank you. But, uh, but if it is true at worst at the other end of the spectrum, note that you, like, you are given very little power because, and this is the very likely scenario, because like ministers in Singapore are incredibly condescending towards your opposition yeah. ministers. There have been many heated debates in parliament where there's a smackdown from like Lee Hsien Long to like Lo Tia Kang, and Lo Tia Kang can, ne can never make a solid comeback because the English is not good enough. That sort of thing, you know. Like, ladies and gentlemen, let's be very clear. The worst case scenario is extremely likely here, okay. and this is where Hui's argumentation about puppet or that sort of puppet, that puppet is very important. Because then they don't actually have any role. But what is the important impact here? Is that you give them, you give people an illusion of oh, there's sufficient opposition voice or su sufficient opposition. But the thing here is this, that unfortunately in the status quo, people have voted in favour. 70% in the last G7, oh, thank you, stop. Like, 70% of people in Singapore currently have, like, voted for the PAP government already, like, in the last election. I'm not sure why. They're like, makes the opposition even more powerful at a point at which the Singapore people have already made the decision to not give the opposition such a huge sway in parliament. What is therefore the best thing to do is to provide the opposition some way to have access to this cause in parliament. That's why the NCMP system is uniquely adequate in that particular regard. I'm not sure why their particular policy is successful at regulating away all the harms that they talk about. Also, I just want to debunk this bombing thing for one second. Like, okay, like, there are designated survivors. If your, your response to VHAS POI is literally people exist in different places, if that is true, then sure, like, I think there's no problem there. There's a line of designated survivors, I'm not sure why. Also, I would like to point out that in the Singapore Parliament, right, literally none of the PAP MPs come and sit down for the discourse, you know. It's empty, ladies and gentlemen. Like, a lot of times they don't turn up. Yeah, yeah. No, thank you. Yes. So, I'm just not sure why that's something that's likely to be a problem in the long term. But before I'm going, yes, closing. Is it a position of opening opposition that the relative powerlessness of the NCMP scheme is the single best way to check and develop Singaporean democracy? Uh, yes. We think it's a brilliant way. Yeah, that's yeah, why yeah. we're talking about it. Okay, so two, ex two extensions on principle. First, let's talk about how underpaying opposition politicians create backlash against the Singapore government, especially like, since like there are a lot, there's a lot of resentment in the status quo. So Singapore prides itself on the rhetoric of work for reward and reward for work. This is principally unfair. It's principally unfair to levy additional duties on these oppo opposition politicians, like Sylvia Law or Pritam Singh, who have work obligations out of their MP roles. The reality is that ministers have the luxury of the ministerial salary such that they don't have to put opposition outside. MPs in Singapore don't actually work full-time as MPs. They work outside of their capacity. What happens under their sub-house is that now they're not remunerated. The principal harm is this. They don't recognize the invaluable contribution of these opposition politicians while you make them trade off the important commitments. But secondly, most if not all paid MPs have careers out. That's it. Right. So that they're made to take on this rigorous role of the most of most of the minister you see. So I think it's a further violation of democracy. Here's why. Because in the status quo, people already have objections to ministerial salary. If you don't pay these people already, Singapore government, the Singapore government is further ignoring the wishes of the citizens, directly violating the essence of democracy in which power flows from the people. So that's the second half. But these principles matter importantly because the Singapore government needs to treat its leaders properly to create a culture of keen opposition. Basically, if you make them sidecar warriors, it is less likely they're going to be able to perform well in their other duties, or they're more likely to be burnt out, leading to the weakening of the opposition bench as a whole, leading to underperformance that makes the public lose confidence in the opposition. So for these particular reasons, we're proud of the votes.
what I'm going to do in my speech is a number of things. One, I will tell you why the current system of democratic preservation in Singapore is unstable, why it is good both for the PAP, the UMBS, of course, the opposition, and for Singapore to have a functioning opposition and for the opposition to grow. Yeah, Two, yeah. I will show you how this policy grows the opposition. Before that, some rebuttal. Okay. The other contentions coming out of opening opposition are that it is bad to give them this position because it sounds fancy, they don't deserve the name. Um, I guess that is true, but I'm not sure why this is particularly important. It's like, if I call this guy Shadow Minister, he does not gain any additional power, even if it is like, morally wrong to call someone he's not because he's not a real minister. I don't know why this matters. The second thing they say is it will slow the cabinet down because they will annoy the ministers. No, that's not what the Shadow Ministers do. They do not sit at the side of the minister and actually shadow them like a real shadow. Um, they do their own work and plan policies in their own offices. Yeah, yeah. But on top of that, you can't slow the PAP down because the PAP gets to set the time of the, the amount of time you want to debate a particular motion. At the end of the motion, then they vote whether the motion passes or not. And since there are more PAP MPs than opposition MPs in Parliament, then the motion will pass. So it doesn't slow the government down. I mean, it slows the government down to the extent the government wants to slow down to the extent the government wants to admit as much debate as it wants on any particular bill or motion. Finally, they say, but this is very unfair to opposition MPs because it makes them do extra work. It is likely the case that one is forced to take on a shadow, a shadow ministerial position. If Pritam Singh decides, no, I really don't want to be shadow PM, the Workers' Party doesn't want to take on shadow cabinet. Yeah, I guess that we won't have a shadow cabinet. But one, I think that's a dumb choice for opposition. And two, if they make a choice, then Singaporeans will see the oppositions for the chances that they are and give a chance for a real opposition party that is prepared to prepare alternative government in waiting to be the opposition. Okay, first question is why a healthy and real opposition is good for both the ruling party and the state? The first thing to note is opposition accepts that democracy or the ability to check the ruling party is important. So if closing up wants to come up and say actually dictatorship or authoritarianism is the way to go, I will take that as a knife and you should judge that. But the first thing to note about this is they acknowledge that nobody has all the solutions necessary to run government. The second thing to note is the way in which democracy is opposition, the presence of opposition rather, and therefore the way democracy functions, is a valuable check on the government, is that it gives the government the fear of being thrown out of power. Now, the government can respond to this in a variety of ways. In a country like Singapore, where the ruling party has significant, no oh, thank you, significant control over many, many levers of the executive, it can choose to shut down the opposition party, or it can choose to debate the opposition party in open water. It has so far chosen the first tactic by not by shrinking the opposition to the point of point uh, at a time where it can not organize, where they cannot form policy, where it cannot do anything. And in so doing, it has made itself far less responsive. The first reason is if you think only of ways to crush the opposition as a way of maintaining power, you are not thinking of ways to address the concerns the opposition is bringing to you via the political yeah, yeah. platform. That is damaging because it means that the PAP is now spending more and more internal effort figuring out how to make sure the opposition has no voice rather than figuring out how to solve the problems of the electorate. The second thing is it is useful to have an opposition as the mouthpiece for disgruntled citizens' conflicts. And the reason for this is the opposition potentially has a greater ability to reach these suspected citizens in the city councils that they run or the grassroots campaigns that they provide. For the government to try to anticipate these concerns purely is a difficult task. That is why the opposition is useful to exist. Note that if in the event where the opposition does not exist in any real form, the only opportunity to check on the government is widespread voter discontent, i.e. the threat of a freak election or some kind of revolt. But that is a deeply unstable system that a ruling party needs to spend lots of effort trying to hit off, yeah, usually yeah. in bad ways. That is why democracy and the presence of some viable opposition is important to make sure that the states and governments function well. Yes, closing. In so far as we, in this debate, can willingly force the PAP into allowing opposition to hear their policy discussion, why can't that be a legislative process in parliament rather than one person shadowing a ministry? I, I, well, I'm not sure why these things are mutually exclusive again, okay, and I'll get off the exclusive benefits of the shadow cabinet. Right, so firstly, what is a shadow cabinet? A shadow cabinet means that Firstly, you have to gather and prepare alternative government in waiting, and that you claim portfolios and do the present the alternative policies for each portfolio. On the debate. If not, you risk being deemed irrelevant and an un un ins insignificant or uh, unable yeah, yeah. opposition. 
The first thing this does for the opposition, if they are compelled to form a shadow cabinet, is this. They are forced to aggregate policies and close the credibility gap that currently exists in Singaporean politics. These guys say it's bad to give opposition policy states, politician state secrets. I will note that it is not that we have to give the most sensitive secrets about national defense to them, but that Singapore currently has an incredibly restrictive policy on giving, releasing any government information to opposition politicians or to the public in general, which should probably be reversed. But note that even if the government refuses to grant this particular plank of the policy, the fact that opposition politicians are now forced into portfolios and to answer for that portfolio in the eyes of the public means that they are compelled to either form policies, which they currently don't, or do the research or fund the research via think tanks and independent uni yeah, yeah. like researchers and universities to inform those policies, to find alternative way of unpicking what the government does not want to give them, all of which build the opposition's reputation and ability to put policy in front of the public. That is the key thing that the opposition today is lacking because Singaporeans, most of us reasonable ones, see the opposition as a branch of chances who don't have reasonable alternatives to present. That's why we don't care about them. The only people who vote for opposition are people who vote for opposition out of protest. That's bad. Second thing is that it forces opposition parties to coordinate and to get their act together. These guys say it's good if they diversify and differentiate, but not in a world where, where Singapore's voting system is first past the post and there's no prospect of voting reform anytime soon. The balkanization of opposition parties dooms them all to electoral irrelevance. They need to be compelled to coordinate and being, giving them the carrot of having a symbolic position of shadow cabinet minister, shadow minister for both fans and so on and so forth, will force them to sort out their differences and put together a policy platform yeah, that Singaporeans yeah. can get on board with. Finally, on predictability. The fact that the opposition has put this together before the election means that in the event that they somehow game power down the road, voters know who they're voting for and what they're voting for. Incredibly important again for the credibility of the opposition in Singapore. We think we need an opposition in Singapore, and this is the way to help get there. Yeah, yeah. Like ridiculously messy, so I'm just gonna go over, like house by house and tell you like the different things that this house have come up with, right? So on OG, the idea there basically, right, is look guys, there are secrets that we need to know, and because of this, there is uh, like we should just give access to like like uh, we should give access to the shadow members to go in and like see these documents. But then the question is, why don't you just like give them the access and then have proper discussions in Parliament, right? Because to change the system that is the Singapore. Um, government's current system, right? You need more legislative power to the government. And having a shadow minister doesn't like change anything because A, this person is still beholden to the same security uh, clearances. And if they were to know like facts and figures, right, it is unclear why a like shadow like cabinet is your solution because then you can just order a mandate that would have these documents be released. So I don't understand OG's case. And then for um, C G, right? They're, they're basically like this utopian that doesn't exist of a perfect Singapore. But their basic idea is, look, opposition needs to aggregate policies and close the credibility gap. No, sir, please sit down. And close the credibility gap. Here's the thing, all right? This is not possible because each opposition party has its own expectations and standards and policy of what is good. What this does mean, though, is that they are very like ridiculously splintered on 
what a good yeah. like um, yeah. opposition party should be. No, thank you. So what use is it having all these people there? Because what will happen on the other hand is that opposition will be seen as weaker because they're trying to like side up to the to the PAP. And what this means is that when different members of opposition, because there are different splinters and parties of opposition, will go into the different sector gates, right? They will see like like if you have one member working with education and another working with like say housing or something, they'll try to prove themselves superior. If it was possible to have a coalition of members, no thank you sir, it would already have been done. They do this every election and they fail every election. So I don't see why this entire case is there, right? So what's the worst case scenario for the opposition in this case, right? Firstly, they do themselves because they, no thank you sir, because they do absolutely nothing, right? Even though they are given the opportunity, it is seen as they have done absolutely nothing. The optics of the like um, opposition party completely fails itself, right? And what this means is that on their best case scenario, op opposition is able to achieve absolutely nothing. No, thank you, sir. Right? And it's like that the basic uh, wants of the opposition party and the context that I'm going to give you for this is that A, they want to uh, like achieve better policies and find out the shortcomings of the PAP. But what this means is that it turns them into like this battering ram. So a shadow member would actually make like parliament a lot more toxic and as a result make Singapore politics a lot more toxic because of the fact that um, because of the fact that they would not be trying to learn from them, they would be trying to use the things that they have learned as a battering ram for the BAP. And this is already status quo. So again, I don't see the point why there's a need for this shadow member to be in place. And right now, like the problem with the uh, opposition party is that they've already like had a very hard time to make their stance clear. And the thing about Singaporeans, as we know, is that they are very short-term voters. So what this means is that they'll vote for the party with the most benefits. And this could be like GST vouchers or your pioneer generation package or whatever. But we don't understand why like the critique coming from this shadow member or like from the off will change the way that the electorate votes, right? It won't. So this is why like, because of the fact that opposition has no like um, clear stance, rather it's hard for them to get that. No, thank you, sir. So moving on, right? I'm going to talk about now. Uh, no, thank you. Um, I'm going to go, uh, go ahead and talk about what we on CO want to do, right? Yeah, yeah. Since OO, since OO basically says yes, we have systems, and OG says we could do more. Our job as CEO is to come in and say that we don't need a shadow. What we want to do is put more like power to legislative processes rather than single hand decisions, and this is why the MNC. The MCNP on our side gains more power because we move things to the legislative process, which allows them to have more power and more decision over the um, okay. over the process. Mm -hmm. uh, we can't give all PAP MPs important documents, so we give them to them by giving them to the cabinet. We can't give all opposition MP parliament documents, so we give them by giving shadow cabinets. We give them specific documents specific to the ministry. That's why we give them a shadow cabinet and give them specific documents. So I give we can't give all PAP MPs all documents, so we choose to give the cabinet. We can't give all opposition MPs all important documents, so we give them to the shadow cabinet. We give finance ministry documents to the shadow okay, cabinet. Okay, but even if you were to give the, these people to the shadow cabinet, they wouldn't have any power to actually do anything about okay. it. No one have any power to any act, actual change. So is it easy to just get everyone in a spot with people watching in the gallery and then like have legislative processes that will allow you to choose like what happens in it? So we don't understand that point, right? We say that on your side, there's absolutely no need for the shadow government there because everything that you want, we can give you on this side without the need for a shadow, shadow cabinet or a shadow government. So I don't see the point of it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So moving on, right? The, the entire concept on their side is basically that the reason why a shadow cabinet is useful is because it's efficient and beneficial. But I've shown you on my side that there is no point in having one, and if anything, it would doom the uh, like opposition to a more problematic, like no, thank you, sir. It would doom the opposition to a more like problematic uh, place where it's harder for them to be seen as a legitimate party. It's a harder for it's harder for them to come together as one proper coalition. And while Jan wants to tell you that there is an actual coalition, we don't have a coalition. So and because most of them are like retired PAP members, so like we like there is no proper coalition of opposition here in Singapore. So I don't understand yeah, yeah. why the entire uh, the entire time they come here and try to no thank you sir. And they try to tell and they try to tell you that they want to have this coalition because it's a very utopian idea of what like Singapore should stand for, right? And that's how we've differentiated ourselves from uh, OO because we've shown you how to get this power to M uh, to the MCNP rather than just telling you that this power should be uh, with the MCNP. 
So in conclusion, because I've shown you firstly the fact that a shadow member would only bring more problems to the uh, to the uh, to side opposition because they wouldn't be useful enough to actually do anything, and uh, because there is uh, there is more uh, transparency and credibility by actually giving power to uh, everyone in place instead of having just um, uh, just a shadow member that is essentially useless and won't be able to like relay any information to side with uh, closing opposition. I debated with Hui just six months ago. I don't know what has changed. Presumably, it's her moving to SMU from NTU. Maybe that's why I'm going to debate was like this. Yeah. But what I do know, as a post-colonial Indian living in India, who has some ties to the British governance systems, is that the debate is not about whether all cabinet members die. Because in that case, yeah. the shadow cabinet doesn't replace them. Players in the by-election. Or a new cabinet yeah, is selected yeah, yeah. by the ruling party. But also the debate is not about NCMPs, which I had no idea about like after opening half, because nobody cared to explain what the full form of that is. But now that I do know, we can have them on our side as well. Because the ruling party still needs and can run legislative yeah, yeah. processes under our side. It's very easy for them to do that, right? They have no votes. Yeah, just come in, man, talk cock, and we'll move on from there, right? Like, what's the harm to PAP to have NCMPs under our side? Two things then, see, on a serious note in my speech. Firstly, opposition and why does it matter? Secondly, sure. democracy and governance. But let's talk about what CEO brings to us. They, brings us. they bring us one key thing. They say, the legislative process is the answer. What is the legislative process? It can be anything. It can be having shadow cabinets. process <laughs> within <laughs> cabinet ministries to do things that we think are necessary to bring government systems in check and balance. The second thing they tell us, ah, but what if free collection happens? We're like, it's worse if free collection happens. And opposition is not prepared to handle how cabinet functions yeah. because they haven't had any preparation, any kind of functioning in that particular instance. They scramble without any experience to pass policies and do and like have discourse on what is good, the Singapore system. Right? Oh, the real debate. Yeah, that is the real debate. Sit <laughs> so so down. Moving on to the two key clashes in this debate then. The first thing that Yarn tells you is that why are shadow parliaments and why is a necessarily good opposition important to any good functioning democracy? Right? Because it's not about confidential documents and the whole discussion not. What Yarn tells you is that he tells you having a shadow cabinet does one very important thing. It puts opposition in a position where, where they do not debate policies by shitting on the current existing policies by the existing ruling party but provide, providing alternative policies and alternative systems of governance yeah. within the particular cabinet. It's done under our side though, because presenting alternative policies is done through researching and funding think tanks, etc., to create alternate conceptions of the Singapore system in which these policies actually do happen. Our proposal makes opposition work on how they would run the government instead, instead of shitting on how the government is run right now. What this does is two things. Sit down. What it does is two things. Because firstly, as Jan tells you, Singapore politics lacks opposition which knows how to govern. And that's the biggest criticism when people come to vote opposition parties in, right? Because that's what PAP says, that they have no experience. They'll create, they'll take Singapore to shit. That means that they say that they have no experience running offices, running cabinet, due to the exact nature of what Bob Bench has mentioned to us, right? That there has never been any other party in power. That 75% of the people do vote for PAP when it comes to it. Because why do people vote that way? Because people vote for opposition only in protest. Because when PAP mentions that they have no experience, it's actually the truth. What, do say, what has changed on our side? We think that no viable opposition does not exist anymore. 
because the no viable opposition is taken away and the shadow cabinets are doing exactly and precisely the things that Singapore needs in an alternative conception of Singapore where they're funding policy research and presenting alternative proposals to running Singapore, to, run, to running the nation. What it mechanistically looks like is encouraging research on alternative policies, working with think tanks and corporates to know what works better for Singapore governance system. Yeah. On the gut side, ruling parties are not likely to fund alternative conceptions of Singapore governance because all they need to do is pass their current conceptions of policies and present research on that, there is research backing it. What they lack instead is an alternative conception where other researchers obviously discount what this present research does. So we give off experience of governing an actual policy making, but more importantly, you make opposition better by not having them shit on what exists right now, but present alternative conceptions of governance which we think are really important to making a democracy and governance function in the first place. Uh, whoever, yeah, wait, uh, another chance to prove your empty blood. CEO's best, the shadow cabinet undermines attention given to the NCMP. At worst, shadow ministers lack any influence over both cabinet and population. Which is it? Under CEO's, sorry, 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 can you repeat it? At CEO's best, the shadow cabinet, no, sorry, at CG's best, the shadow cabinet gives attention to, uh, undermines attention given to the NCMP by the population. At your worst, shadow ministers lack any influence over both cabinet and population. Your NCMP's lack attention. Yes. <laughs> So what la? Yeah, our, yeah. our end case is that make Singapore governance better la bro. So it doesn't matter whether it's through NCMP, shadow cabinet, we think shadow cabinets work better. You take away attention from NCMP, okay la, we remove NCMP, I agree la. Let's go forward, shadow cabinet much better. Dude, I don't, I don't understand like why is this a, why is this a debate? Because all these necessary processes can exist under our side, coupled with the fact that shadow, shadow cabinet ministries exist and there's discussion necessary process happening. I don't understand that why NCMPs with no voting power to actually deliberate on anything is just like it's just like non-voting shares in corporates matter. And I think it's easier for you to understand that way. That if I hold a share in say Goldman Sachs of the world, I can't decide what board directors do with their investments. <laughs> nobody cares about my vote. Simply NCMPs, also nobody cares. Literally nobody. I sit at home, I never read the straight times. To be honest, I never do. But more importantly, what is more important? The second thing that is more important is voting opposition, right? Because for the reasons that I told you now. The voting population in Singapore doesn't vote in protest for opposition. What it votes for is, 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 is the second most important thing in Singapore politics, right? That people often vote for opposition in protest against the PAP. We remove that barrier. We say that now you have very low numbers voting in protest. Now you have firstly, now you know who you are getting in parliament when you vote for them. Because you have seen the policies that they come up with, you've seen the alternative proposals that they come up with, you've seen research backing those proposals and policies, and now you know what you're gonna get. But secondly and more importantly, even if you think PAP is the best, which I agree with, love PAP, but <laughs> even if you think PAP, PAP is the best, equally importantly, if opposition fails to present a viable alternative case, if PAP wins at the ballot box, yeah. then they deserve to win. Because now the people at the voting population know that opposition failed to provide a viable alternative for governing the Singapore system in and of itself. It's not about opposition claiming that they could have done a much better job, it's that they didn't when they lost at the ballot box. We think we legitimize the vote of the public, we legitimize the ballot box in and of itself. Side closing government. Singapore has failed at forming an effective
Conservative Coalition every single time they have attempted yeah, yeah, yeah. to do it. In the context, SPP, SDA, SDP, all of our opposition parties that exist are splinters of the PNP and splinters of the WP. Why? Because there was politicking and infighting that made them not agree with one another, that meant they couldn't see things eye to eye. This landed in two things. One, they couldn't agree to just not compete with one another, which meant numerous seats were split three ways because they just couldn't see eye to eye on it. But two, they couldn't even agree on a coalition manifesto because they couldn't see ideals of what this manifesto should look like. In this context of what our opposition coalitions look like, what is the coalition shadow government going to do? This was Tyrone's extension that Birat didn't want to engage with. We think that giving them more access to documents is probably going to bring all of this infighting, all of this politicking, all of this splintering to the forefront. The consequence of this is a weakening opposition in the eyes of the voters rather than one that sees the opposition as strong. The result is that instead of using it to build an opposition voice and an opposition stranglehold, you build specific parties' agendas against each other rather than against the PAP. This brings the possibility of a weaker opposition in the eyes of the voting base that's significantly worse than, than the ideas on their side of a stronger government. That's an extension they didn't want to contest with on that side. We're going to how alternatives get formed, which is the whole crux of what opposition should be doing in a bit before that go. Constructive discussion in Parliament and in public will already happen. The way to up the credibility is when they have constructive discussion that's based on empirical facts, which you don't get without those documents. Okay, alternatives, that's the thing, right? That you want people to see new policy agendas and alternatives that these people can form. They must have facts to do this, they must have ability to do that. Um, here's the deal. I don't know why a shadow cabinet is the solution to this problem. Right? If the idea is that you want to give people empirical facts, you want to have a proper discussion of alternatives, you want that to be a contest of what the agendas could be and create proper solutions that could contest the PAP solutions, I don't know why creating a shadow office in the Ministry of Education or a shadow office in the Ministry of Finance is the solution to this problem. Which is why we think that the power should, hand, should land in the hands of the members of Parliament. Right? That rather than creating new ministers, a new ministerial officers. The solution should be to have these facts and figures on the ground or within what members of parliament so that members of parliament can debate, deliberate and discuss these facts to create solutions and to have these solutions out in the open. Yes, OG's grab is up, but not all the documents can be shared. I don't know why quantity of documents changes yeah, yeah. quality of debate. We think that if you have all the key important information to create policies, that is more than sufficient yeah, to have yeah. a valuable debate in order to be able to aggregate the best solutions for the government. We think that if there is something that is so secret that cannot be revealed to the public, then probably the likelihood of the shadow cabinet minister being able to do anything with this information is zero anyway. Yeah, yeah. Right? If you have to go through all of the security clearance briefings in order to read this one document, after you have read it, what you do with it, you cannot tell anyone about it because no one else has the same security clearance, right? So after learning all of this information, you don't get any access to any of this information anyway. We think that the best case scenario is being able to force a system where you force the PAP to get rid of their black curtain that exists right now. Right? The PAP already has this system where they do everything behind clo closed doors and then come to parliament saying, here's the complete bill and then never have to discuss it ever again. If we're going to change the way parliament works, instead of creating a shadow cabinet, maybe the solution is don't allow this closed door to exist, right? Then you must bring the vote to the parliament, have a debate, have a legislative process, and be able to deliberate the conclusions of that situation so that you don't have the, you, so that you don't have the kinds of problems that they talk about. A lot of what the gov bench case is, is that oppositions don't get the opportunity to discuss or engage in these well, ideas. That's something that you can solve without a shadow cabinet. Closing. Closing. So this is not address the same part of the debate at all because shadow cabinet is about what happens outside the legislative chamber where I think if the current opposition can't handle the pressure of being shadow cabinet, then let the past die, kill you if you have to. The point is having a shadow cabinet structure for opposition parties structurally required for opposition is impossible. Um, yeah, so you can create the structure, yeah, they yeah. will fill the gaps with individuals. So leader of SDP becomes shadow finance minister, leader of WP becomes shadow prime minister, leader of SDA becomes shadow education minister. Fine, the structure exists. 
What happens after the structure is put in place? How does the SDA, SDP and WP come together and say, you know what, let's share the information we get from each other and use it not against each other but against the PAP. If they've never done this up to now, why would they be willing to use the structure in an advantage that hurts only the PAP and not themselves? We've seen this in the past. Where whenever the opposition tries to come together, they end up self-sabotaging themselves in credibility in the eyes yeah. of the voters. This structure of the shadow cabinet doesn't change that. In fact, it makes it worse because you're giving them a structure to fail in. Yes, this means that all of your ability or all of the outcomes that they want to achieve about a better political system that is more transparent, that is more accountable, will all die because you never have the kind of transparency and accountability. But at the same time, you allow for people to go up. Ah, but there is a system. So the system will solve the problems. But it doesn't. It just makes the problems worse and inherently makes the problems exist for an even longer period of time and assumes a solution when there isn't one. In our world, you allow for better deliberation, debate and discourse without the structure of the shadow cabinet because it's an open discussion where all the parties learn the same information. Members of the SDA, SDP and WP get same access to information because it's not just one part of the structure that gets this information, but all of the opposition gets the same access of the information. So even if they did compete with each other, it's a fair and open democracy across parties rather than an infighting, politicking one that makes our opposition weaker. If you want a better democracy, the solution is to open it up in the parliament and not in the shadow cabinet. Yeah, yeah, yeah.